When the Buddha describes the steps for breath meditation, he describes them in such a way that he wants you to be sensitive to three kinds of fabrication, or sankara, that you're doing right now, and that you're doing all the time. One is bodily fabrication, the in and out breath. Second is verbal fabrication, the way you talk to yourself. In his terms, it's directed thought and evaluation. You think of a topic, and then you make comments on it. And then the third is mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. Perceptions are the images you hold in mind, the names you give to things, the meanings you give to things. And feelings are feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. It's all very simple. But he wants you to see these things because, as he points out elsewhere, that when we engage in these activities in ignorance, that sets the whole process of dependent arising into play. And that's what ultimately leads to suffering. So when you breathe in ignorance and talk to yourself in ignorance and hold perceptions and feelings in the mind in ignorance, you're going to suffer. When we work with these things in breath meditation, we bring knowledge to these things. Seeing where they're stressful, seeing where they're not stressful, seeing where they're helpful, skillful, where they're not helpful, not skillful. And then we translate that knowledge into the rest of our lives. Because it's not the case that we're creating suffering for ourselves only when we sit here and meditate. It's happening all the time. And you want these tools to help take apart the way you create suffering for yourself. Case in point is anger. When you're angry, you tend to breathe in a certain way. That's not easeful. In fact, often it's because of the way you breathe that you get feelings of tightness in the chest and the stomach. And you feel you've got to get that anger out of your system. And of course, in getting it out of your system, you tend to do and say stupid things, things that are really not in your own best interest. And then, of course, you're talking to yourself about how horrible it is that the situation you find yourself in, or what somebody has done. And you magnify the aspects that would stoke the anger. And then there are the perceptions you hold in mind. One of the real worst ones, of course, is that this has been going on for a long, long time. I just can't stand it any longer. But there are other perceptions about the person who may be doing things that you think are unskillful. And you're right to be angry. All of which lead you to do and say, think, all kinds of unskillful things, things that are not in your best interest. Now, when you have this knowledge, you can take this emotion apart, and it's seeing it in these terms that allows you to get beyond it. It's not a matter of simply watching it come and saying, "Well, I'm, well, while I'm angry, I'll just watch the anger." And then when it goes, that'll be the end of it. Because it's not the end of it. When things simply die out on their own, it's not that they go away for good. They're just quiet, and then come back again. And the Buddha wants you to get beyond just watching things coming and going. When he talks about cessation, the cessation of suffering, he really means what he says. It stops. Period. That's the end of it. And it can be ended only through discernment. And discernment sees things in terms of these fabrications. But the Buddha also describes five steps by which you can get beyond any unskillful state. And they apply to these three fabrications. The first, he says, is to see the origination of that state. What sparked the anger? And here he's not talking about events outside. He's talking about how are you talking to yourself right now? What perceptions are you holding in mind? Usually it's a perception. Someone says something and an image appears in your mind. It sets you on fire. Well, what was the image? That's what you want to look for. This is the Buddhist whole approach. 
things that we suffer from are not so much what other people do outside or situations outside. It's how we approach them. Things outside can be pretty bad. Other people can be pretty bad. We don't deny that. And it can be, as the mind says, only natural that you respond to ang with anger to certain situations. But we're trying to get beyond what's natural. We want something better than natural. You think of all those stories in the canon, the story of the young prince whose parents have been killed by a certain king, and then he decides to get revenge. So he goes to work first in the elephant stables of the king, plays the flute for the elephants. It's a nice touch. The elephants are soothed by the flute music. Well, it turns out the flute music doesn't stay just in the elephant stables. It wafts into the chambers of the king. He likes the sound. So as the young man called in, the young man plays the flute for him. And the king says, well, now you can stay in as part of my, my retinue. And so the young man, the young prince, works hard to be trustworthy. And finally gets the king in a situation where they're just one-on-one, -on -one and he can kill him if he wants to. But then he remembers what his father once said, when the, just before he died. He said, don't look too far, don't look too close. Animosity is not ended through animosity, it's ended through non-animosity. The basic message, don't try to get revenge. But he decides to follow his father's advice. The Buddha tells this story to a group of monks who have been arguing over some really minor affairs, to the point where they're going to have a split. And as he says, your noble warriors who live by the sword, even they can display forbearance and forgiveness. Why can't you? And so it would have been only natural for the prince to kill the king, but he wanted something better than natural. And this is what's inspiring about the story. We hear so few inspiring stories. We live in a world that seems very uninspiring, but you can behave in an inspiring way. You can decide, I'm not going to give in to this anger. So you turn around and say, okay, what is it in the mind that's sparking the anger? And said, so it could be the way you breathe, it could be the way you talk to yourself, the images you hold in mind. That's where you look. And if you've been working with the breath meditation, right? you have experience in looking there. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't act in situations where things are unfair or oppressive, but if you act with anger, it's not going to help. If you not overcome the anger, and then you can see more clearly what sh should be done and when it should be done, how it should be done. So the, the part of the mind that says, okay, I have every right to be angry about this. You have the right, but that right can be wrong, it leads you to do wrong things. It's wiser and more inspiring not to give in to the anger. So use that kind of thinking to counteract the origination. And then you notice how the anger passes away. It comes and it goes, and it comes back again. The potential may be there, but the question is, what well, sparks it? And when the spark dies out, how does it go away? And you realize that it's not as all-powerful as you thought, which is a good lesson to learn. And when it comes back again, and you go for it again, you have to ask, well, what is attractive about that anger? Again, there's something in the anger itself that the mind finds attractive. There may be a sense of power, a sense of self-righteousness. I was a feeling that once you can recognize someone has done something really wrong and gives you the right to do all kinds of things you otherwise wouldn't feel that you had the right to do. You have to look into it. What is the allure? And then you look at the drawbacks. If I actually acted on this anger, even I just thought these thoughts of anger, where would they leave me? 
what would be the results. You have to you know, rub your nose in all the stupid things you've done under the power of anger, or you've seen other people do under the power of anger. Remind yourself you really would prefer to be beyond the power of that thing. And when you get to the point where it loses its allure, that's when you can escape. You develop dispassion for it. The word dispassion is not an attractive one, especially in our culture. But it basically means that you grow up. Whatever flavor you got out of the anger loses its appeal. The Buddha often talks about how dispassion follows on disenchantment. And the word for disenchantment, Nibbida, can also mean that sense of having had enough of a certain kind of food you don't want anymore. You're full. To the point of even disgust for the idea of eating anymore. That's the kind of attitude you want to develop. And that's how you free yourself. We don't usually think of dispassion and freedom together. Dispassion sounds like gray oatmeal. But it is the way to open up. As we grow up, become more mature inside, there's a greater sense of freedom in the mind. So this is how the breath meditation connects to learning to understand your mind, understand the processes of fabrication, so you can do something about your lust and your anger and your jealousy. And these are the qualities that seem to have so much flavor, but are really bad for you. And you learn to appreciate the flavor that the Buddha is recommending, which is a taste of freedom. So as you're focusing on the breath, then it seems to be far away from the big issues of life. Remember, you're taking things apart. So you can see a lot of the big issues come down to these little tiny building blocks. And if you can see the building blocks and see that you don't have to put them together in that way, that's when your mind really grows. Not just the mind, the heart. The word jitta in Pali, which is used for mind, also means heart. You're trying to develop both sides. because they grow together.